You're up. Um, so I, Doug and I were talking a little bit about the book beforehand, and I, one of the things you were saying to me was that this book is different from your other books. And I was wondering if you could talk about why and how and who your sort of what your goal is with um, throwing rocks at the Google book. I don't know if it started out different, but I mean, most of the books I write, they kind of end up meaning something to people about ten years after they come out, <laughs> <laughs> which is cool in a way because it means like got foresight or impressive or something, but it sucks in a way because the conversation I want to have at that time I can't have. And then 10 years later when I'm kind of done with that conversation or on to something else, people want to talk about it. So then I'm trying to dig up what, what, what did all that mean. Um, this book, I started to, I mean I was thinking about this book uh, two or three books ago, but I didn't really have an answer. I was, I was getting increasingly concerned about why things weren't working out quite like they could be or should be. You know, why were, was digital technology not yielding the, you know, the Burning Man-like rave that I had imagined society becoming in the early 90s? Um, and I couldn't put my finger on, on exactly what it was. I understood that uh, uh, young developers were taking too much money too early and then having to change their companies in order to deliver to their VC what they wanted, 100x return, but killing the actual idea. And uh, so I started writing about that, and I, I decided when I was going to write this book, I, I understood what the problem was, but I didn't understand what the solution was. So I said, look, if I get a year or so to write a book, I will figure out not only what's wrong, but how to fix it. And you know? since most people haven't, uh, read the book. I'm guessing it came out today, so we're in the middle of copies. Uh, do you want to talk about what the problem, like, the, what's your sort of sound like theory before getting people to understand the problem? Well, the main problem is that we, uh, in a nutshell, I mean, this has got to be unpacked, I guess, but in a nutshell, what we've done is we've optimized the digital economy for the accumulation of capital instead of optimizing it for the velocity of money. And the latter, the velocity of money, is much more consonant with the distributed architecture of the internet itself, and would lead to a whole lot more happiness than, than what we've got. You know, the, the easiest way of understanding the problem is that there's all these great developers who are willing to disrupt one industry or another. You know, they'll disrupt publishing or disrupt music. But then as soon as they've got their idea kind of down, they run to the equivalent of daddy at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, and they surrender their disruptive idea to another operating system that they act as if it isn't even there. They assume that venture capital and an IPO and acquisition and the stock market and 100x returns, that that's just this pre-existing condition of nature. That that's the real system that we have to somehow uh, uh, succumb to. And so you look at something, you know, when, when I saw, and these are friends of mine. I mean, we all have friends now who are billionaires, which is strange in itself. But, but, but I saw the founders of Twitter on the cover of the Wall Street Journal the day they had their IPO. And under each of their faces was the number of billion dollars that each of them were worth. And I'm thinking here, I know two different people who are worth over five billion dollars each, but I found myself feeling sorry for them. Because I realized that these are the guys, they disrupted, you know, Visa and MasterCard with PayPal, originally anyway. They disrupted journalism with, with Twitter. And now, here they were, surrendering what they had done, and surrendering all that disruption to the biggest, baddest industry on the block. You know, because when they let you ring the bell at the NASDAQ Stock Exchange and clap for you, it's not because you've done something disruptive. Like, it's, because, it's because you've confirmed the primacy of corporate capital to the whole scheme. And you've, you've 
made, you've enslaved yourself and your company now to pivoting towards a 100x or a 1,000x return and away from whatever it did. So now we're here with Twitter, one of my favorite apps, by the way, Twitter, a 140-character app that makes $500 million a quarter, and that's considered an abject failure by Wall Street. <laughs> that's a failure, and the company now has to go become what? Like, video, advertising, blah, blah, and where goes Twitter? You know, and so what I wanted to do is figure out what could they have done and what could we do to have a development path that leads, uh, that leads to something other than just magnifying this growth imperative, which is driving us off a cliff anyway. So, and we were talking about this, and we talked a little bit about what companies can do and, and what individuals can do, and, and there's a role for government to play in all this as well, right, as a, as a public policy person. Like, uh -huh. what should we, how do we incentivize change? Like, this, if the system is in place, how are we going to start to take down the system? Well, and I hate to sound libertarian here, but I will for a moment, because I'm not. But <laughs> one thing the government can do is change the nature of their regulations. I, I'm not saying deregulate the marketplace so that Wall Street can go crazy. Or deregulate so that the rich can have rich. What I'm saying is don't, right now, Regulations aren't really being made in the interest of people anyway. The people who write the regulations are the very largest players in the industry. So when a, a simple non-tech example would be, uh, there was a big uh, uh, lead paint scare in the toy industry a bunch of years ago. A bunch of Dora toys or something had red paint in it. They were all outsourced from China. They came in, they had lead paint. So what do we do? Well, we're going to form a commission get the leaders of industry together with the leaders of government and come up with regulations to prevent this from happening again. And the regulations they came up with was a testing process that required $40,000 per toy that you're going to release on the market. What is small toy manufacturer supposed to do with that? If you make handcrafted toy trains that you want to sell to a toy store, how do you, how do you participate in that? Well, you can't. So industry used their own mistake, their own problem of big industry as an excuse to regulate the marketplace so that it would advantage them even more. Right? So regulation right now favors the, favors the largest players on the block. Right? The reason why Uber can move into New York is because they have a war chest. The investment in Uber is not paying for the app. The investment in Uber is paying to deregulate the marketplace in their favor. So that's one. The other biggie, and it's a simple tax shift, is, I mean, the, the simple way to say it is, right now, in the, the way our, I sound like Bernie here. Um, <laughs> right now, our tax code, our tax, no, our tax, the simple problem with our tax code is that capital gains are taxed much, much less than real earnings, than dividends. Right? So what is that? If you're thinking of it as a computer program and now you're biasing it so that people who make money by simply having money don't have to pay taxes, but people who make money by earning money have to pay taxes. What are you building into that system? Right? If you want to optimize your economy for the accumulation of capital, for the extraction of poker chips from the playing board into the accounts of shareholders, then optimize it that way. If you want to optimize the economy for the circulation of capital through the, through the society so that people can create and exchange value between each other, then you want to reverse that bias. You want, to, you want taxes on dividends and earnings to be really low and taxes on capital accumulation to be high. So how do we make that happen? Like, how do we actually get people to change? And what can, and what can people who are here do? in day-to-day -day choices or um, in choices of, with their startups that they're working on? Well, I mean, the easy way to disempower the sitting bags of capital that are there is to try, in some ways, try to ignore them, which is hard to do. You create an application with two friends, and you can build it pretty much on a laptop, and then use a scalable server, even go to Amazon Cloud, I don't care, give them, go to something scalable. You don't need 10 millions of dollars from Y Combinator to 
get to the next level. Once you bring those people in, now you're in a different game. Now you're no longer building a business for the prosperity of that business. Now you're building a business in order to sell it. And so if your goal is to create a thriving, sustainable business, then think twice about selling it. Right? Don't sell it. Here, hold on to it. So that's sort of number one. Uh, as individuals, it's really, I mean, as consumers, you can make way better choices about how you buy things. You know, it's as simple as if someone buys my book from a local bookseller instead of from Amazon, I mean, their local bookseller, now there is money that is circulating in their community. That's a dollar more. It's a dollar more for that book, but you're going to see that dollar circulate through your community five times. So you're going to get that dollar five more times than you would if you spent it on Amazon and it goes up into a share price, or you're spending it in a company that's taking a loss on the book in order to create a platform monopoly in publishing so they can hop over into what's called another vertical and take that over. Right? They don't care about the books. They care about the monopoly. So it's a very different, a very different thing. You can, if you're organizing a company, consider how can your company make everyone who touches your company wealthy. Right, the traditional corporate industrial tactic is to look at everybody else as a resource to extract value from them. But if you're extracting value from your customer base, eventually they get too poor to be your customer. That's the problem that Walmart is having now. The towns that Walmart has gone into are going bankrupt. They're losing their customers, so now Walmart's closing stores and the towns are having to figure out, oh, how do we rebuild a local infrastructure? How do we rebuild, how do we create a, a drugstore? And a, and a, and a, a bookstore and everything else that we need to replace this big vacuum that came to our community and wiped out our, uh, uh, our connective tissue. Uh, companies can start thinking about communicating with their shareholders differently. So instead of being beholden to the growth of the share price, start telling your shareholders they're going to get dividends. They're going to earn real money for, what, for, for owning a, a portion of your company. Create companies as platform cooperatives where your workers are owners in the company. There's a competitor to Uber who's just going to be opening in New York called Juno in a few weeks. And it's the same basic idea as Uber except they pay the cabbies more and the drivers own 50% of the company. Now what does it mean when the drivers own 50% of the company? It means that when that company eventually pivots, as they all will, to mechanical cars driven by computers, you haven't done the research and development for the thing that will replace you. You've done the research and development for the company that you own. Right? So now the drivers are going out doing your work. Your job has been replaced, but your income hasn't been taken away because you own the thing. So these are, these are really... They sound complicated, but they're really simple things to do. They're just the basic steps. You have to think of things. We're in a digital age. You have to think of the, the, the mechanisms that you're, that you're using and that the instruments that you're putting into place, you have to think of them like programs that are going to keep going, that are going to have uh, operating principles and bias them towards circulation, bias them towards making people wealthy. I promise you, if you have a business that's making its customers wealthy, that's making its suppliers wealthy, that's making its competitors wealthy, they're going to keep you around. But, but it's just not the way we think. Oh, make other people wealthy? Yes, make them wealthy so they can buy stuff from you. you know, and it's not, uh, it, it's not rocket science to do that. And to that point, it's, that's another policy suggestion, right? Building in mechanisms for other types of businesses, because cooperative businesses of that model that you're describing aren't actually possible in a lot of um, in a lot of places. So that's another. Right. I mean, luckily, there's things like B corps and multi-purpose corps. There's a lot of alternative corporate structures that you can adopt now that let you value things other than your fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. You know, it's it's. From an economics perspective, it's understanding that when you take in capital and you let a venture capitalist be in charge of your company, then the only contribution he's going to value is capital. But if you understand economics, you understand there's three main factors of production. Capital is one of them, but land and labor are the other two. This is back to Adam Smith and any, any economist, any libertarian will tell you, land, labor, and capital. So how do we value the land and labor again? 
Right? That's by building it into the core of the company to understand that there are three kinds of contributions and all three have to be rewarded by the company. You can't just look at a company as venture capital that's extracting value from land and labor or you end up with a world that's going to die and the people with no jobs. So it's, I don't, it's interesting, like you mentioned Y Combinator earlier, and I, you know, a lot of people, a portion of why the people are going to them are for the VC funding. But it's also for them mentorship models. Because there's a question I would have, does everybody know how to do this, right? And I, I think the answer is probably that they don't. Mm -hmm. But so if they're not, if some of what needs to change is actually the advice they're getting, like how do we build a better um, support system for changing the thinking around how business happens? Like are there evangelists that exist that we can start to, tell their stories more? Does it need to be a special, different type of incubator that actually focuses on this type of model? Like, how can we change the, the community around? I mean, let's do it. Um, you know, it's part of what Civic Hall is for. It's part of what, why we're here. It's part of why I wrote this book to say, here's a manual to begin. So understand what went wrong and understand how to, how to do it right. I mean, there's people around. Talk to Trevor Schultz at the New School, who's starting a whole organization on, is he here? Oh, yeah. uh, for a platform partners with Nathan, Nathan Schneider. Talk to uh, Michelle Bowens at the Peer to Peer Foundation. Go to p2pfoundation.net and you'll see tons of articles. Talk to um, Robin Hood in Finland. Talk to Inspiral in New Zealand. I mean, there are a lot of groups out there. A lot of them are looking at, at uh, blockchain even. A lot of those folks are sort of looking at how can we do authentication in a peer to peer way. I mean, they get those, those efforts get sidetracked really fast because people invest in them. And they go, oh, Bitcoins, Bitcoins, I'm gonna make money. You know, they, once you see the Wake Boss Brothers anywhere, you know, stay away. Um, they did a bunch of uh, investing in Bitcoin. But you know, there, are, um, there are mentors out there, but honestly, I feel like um, a lot of people know in their gut what they're doing right. It's not rocket science. The, the young people, that when they're in their dorm room in Stanford or Columbia and they come up with that idea, I feel like so many of them would be better off with $50,000 and no mentorship than $5 million in the mentorship they're getting. And the mentorship they're getting, they're not dumb. They're smart people, the VC guys. They're smart, but they're smart at doing a very particular thing, which is bringing something to exit, right? Bringing something to, a, to a, an exit event. And I mean, gosh, I've got friends in here. You're David Benham. It's in here right now with, with, a, with a product called Ready, you know, which has just gotten away from venture capital. And now it's like, oh, we can just do this thing. You know, it used to be called bootstrapping, but, or, or these days they call it bootstrapping, but it used to just be called building a business. You build a business, you get some revenue, you use some of that revenue to live and some of that revenue to invest back in the company. It's a slower growth thing, but when you grow slower, so much easier to develop a product that your customers like because then you can see your customer reaction. You can use good old fashioned quarters and semi annual feedback and adjust and change. You're not stuck on the clock of 18 months. I've got 18 months to turn this thing around. That's not fair to any business that's in the real world. Well, some of it probably is that people don't see these things, right? I mean, I think of the, of the initiatives that you just mentioned, how many people in the room know of one of them? I've heard of one of them. I've got about 10 hands, too. Well, you've heard of a lot of them. You've heard of Lumio as a great uh, decision-making tool that came out of General Assembly. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of them you won't hear of, right? Just like a lot of the best candidates for president you've probably never heard of. You know, we heard of Trump. <laughs> you know? You know, so it's like, just, just because you don't know them doesn't mean they're not great. And the fact is, a lot of them are local. There is nothing wrong with creating a business that doesn't scale up. Not everything scales up. Scaling up is an artifact of the industrial age where you've got to become the one, the winner, the king of the hill. You can actually be one of many in your business. That's actually cool. There used to be these guilds. There were many people who built bridges and made houses and made shoes and they had guilds and they shared technologies and, and innovations with each other. And they understood that if everyone gets better, we're all doing better. They built a culture around what they did. You know, now it's as if you know, the economic term is the Gini number. The Gini, it's as if, uh, uh, the Gini number is, is the number that, if it's at zero, it means that everything's distributed everywhere. If it goes to one, it means all the money has been scooped up by one player. It feels like the digital economy is structured so that 
there's going to be one big winner. It's like at the poker game at the end of the night when the one guy gets all the chips. Like, will it be Jeff Bezos? Will it be Mark Zuckerberg? Will it be uh, Sergey? You know, who's going to get everything? And that's because they're so addicted to scale. And even in our, in our good lefty progressive world, it's like I have so many kids come up to me and they want to. I want to create a platform that can aggregate all of the websites that are aggregating the people who are doing social change. <laughs> and everybody wants to do that because everybody wants to have the thing that brings the thing that brings the thing. And I, I get that that's that sort of industrial age thinking and it's not as much fun as just doing the thing locally. It's so hard in a world where we all want 20,000 Twitter followers and we all want the recognition, but the satisfaction you get in creating like Greenlight Bookstore and, and Greenpoint and having a community of people who love what you do, that you're supporting, becoming a human scale economies are local. They just are. And when they're local, they necessarily respect land. When they're local, they necessarily respect labor because those are the people who are paying the taxes to put your kids to school. So you need everybody to be participating. It's so much more enjoyable. So sure, you can come up with some mechanisms that people can model in lots of different places. But uh, in terms of having a, a satisfying business, you know, this is part of what we're retrieving in the digital age. It's a very almost medieval approach to business, you know, where it's part of my city, it's part of the place I live, and I do something. You know, we make fun of people making artisanal beers and you know, uh, you know, heritage yams or whatever. <laughs> what do the wealthiest people do when they retire? They go and make beer and yams and orchids and stuff. That's actually fun to do. And if you can do it in a way that supports your community and they're doing something that supports you, you start to see. Not all of it, but a larger percentage of your economic activity ends up taking place in a sphere between people on a, on a more local scale. And yeah, you're going to still buy your iPhones from you know, Apple and multinational conglomerates, but it doesn't have to be the entire economy. It's interesting. I, Lumi is a good example. I was actually on the phone that night, mm -hmm. last week. Um, he was telling me about what started as the Occupy movement in Taiwan, uh, and there's been a lot of organizing on Lumio for it, that group. Um, and now a lot of them have actually, the government sort of had a turning point and was like, all right, we hear you, we're in, what do we need to do? And have hired a bunch of them. And so what you're seeing is actually these now activists are becoming government employees and starting to do process change internally. And I don't, it's hard for me to, I was listening to him and I was like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> How does that, how do we see something like that happen here? You know, we, there, there were inklings of it, I think some of it's still going on, um, but it's less of the narrative that we're seeing at the moment, right? Especially today on the, um, an election day. But it's like, how do we change that? Or how do we find those local stories and get people paying attention to the, the local issues and the sort of local economy questions? Like, is that possible here? What needs to be that breaking point, I guess, is sort of the, the attention-getting media that we currently employ are not the very best ones for telling the kinds of stories that you're talking about. The, the, the clickbait, you know, Donald Trump insulting black people is way better clickbait than General Assembly tool employed for civic re-engagement in Thailand. You know? <laughs> but the people in Thailand where that app is being used end up having a lived experience that's different. You know, I, I'm actually becoming okay with national global media being the disconnected freak show that it is, as long as I've got a real life of actual connections with other people that is something else. I mean, there's a certain, what we're, the big picture of what we're doing is reasserting the human agenda. That's really what we're doing. I mean, the, 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 my, my bigger case here is to get people to join Team Human. You know, rather than Team Computer, or team capitalism or team system. We are mistaking the metrics that we put on the wall for the betterment of humanity. 
And the way to get in touch with what's good for people really is on a local level. There's these good old fashioned things like making eye contact with people. It's so rich. It's like it's such a weird thing to do if you've been online for so much of your life. Make eye contact with people, sit in spaces with people, see how your town is actually functioning. You know, go to a, a, a school board meeting, join a community supported agriculture group. Set up a local currency in your town. I mean, there's so many things you can do. And no, you're not going to get, I mean, you might get some late night MSNBC, you know, small business innovation. You might get a little something. But in some ways, getting a lot of media attention for something, in some ways, is a reverse indicator. It's a reverse indicator because it means that in some way, it's, it, they've been able to frame it as part of industrialism as, oh, this is going to scale up, this is going to work for everybody. The fact is, things work differently in all different places. We all have lots of different models. Some of those models can be, can be uh, uh, you know, modeled and shared, but they're always going to be tweaked, and that's what you really want to be able to do. You know, the beauty of the digital age, this is the digits of the digital age, is the fingers, is that it's a hands-on thing. It can restore the human scale to stuff. And when you're restoring human scale, you start thinking less in terms of, oh, let's put this big shopping mall there. And rather, how are we going to create a circulation of, of currency between the business people in our community already? So I mean, I, I don't mean to not answer your question, but I think <laughs> the object of the game is not to get attention for the ideas. I mean, that's my job right now, right? I wrote this book, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to stump, and I'll fight, and hopefully some people will read it. That's what books were for, to disseminate. I thought the Boy Scout manual was one of them. This is another one. You know, get it out there, let people see it. It's as easy as a PDF. Like, the, the trap we don't want to get into is sort of the trap that Obama fell into after the, the, the stock market crash, is to think that, OK, business as usual, what do we do? i got to get a bank to lend money to a corporation to build a factory in that town to hire people and get them jobs. Uh-uh. That's the thing that just failed. What he should have done was sent a PDF to Lansing and say, here's how you set up a time bank. Here's how you set up a favor bank. Here's how you do local currency. So that people understand if you have people with skills and people with needs, that's all you need for an economy. And that's all we used to need for an economy. And that's why in the book I go all the way back to 1100. The last time we had a free-form bazaar, a marketplace with market currencies that were only good for the day, that were biased towards transaction. How do we get people the bread they need, the chickens they need, the shoes they need, and uh, to invest in the local bridge? That was what they were thinking, and they optimized their currency for that. The problem was really wealthy people were getting relatively less wealthy as the burgers, as the middle class rose. So they made local currencies illegal. They had to borrow money from the central bank. They made being in business for yourself illegal. They created the chartered monopoly, which became the corporation today. Chartered monopolies were defended by law. <coughs> Today's platform monopoly is defended by technology, by, you know, las cucarachas entran, pero no pueden salir, kind of technology. Meaning, these are one-way technologies. Once you bring this technology into your business, into your life, it's really hard to get it out, because you become dependent on it. Right? They use what's called um, defensible outcomes. That's the startup term. You want defensible outcomes. That means people use what you've got, but then can't go to something else. Right? And that's not the way to do business. I mean, some of what you're getting at is actually, I mean, it seems to me like it's just at odds with the using, using technology to solve a problem. And, and one of the things I always think about when you look at something like Lumio, to come back to that example, the technology isn't super crazy innovative out there or advanced. It's actually uh, it's a pretty simple tool. And what it comes down to is people enforcing the rules of using that tool. Yeah. Right? So it's still about, it's, it is about the human interactions. It's nothing, it's just a, it's it an is. easy to use participatory Absolutely. tool. Absolutely. You know, I'm not a techno solutionist, as it were. I don't think there's a computer program we write, a new operating system that changes everything. There's not an app to fix this. You know, we can't just do an, update overnight and then the economy and the government and everything works. It, it doesn't happen like that. But we have moved from a, a broadcast era, an electronic age, into a digital age. We're living in what, what McLuhan would call a digital media environment. And that doesn't mean digital just that we're going to all use digital tools, but it means the, the, the way in which we make decisions. 
is going to be informed by a more digital, programmatic, algorithmic sensibility. Right? And that's one that's really valuable to us. So yeah, these are simple human solutions. They're not complicated technologies. It's not a matter of better encryption. Right? It's a matter of better listening. You know, it's a matter of better connection, better contact. Yeah, I always, uh, the thing I think is interesting is it's, right now we have such a focus on the tool solving the problem. So even when we tell the stories of where there are good things happening, we focus on the technology as opposed to the human interaction. Well, it's a perfect TED talk. Right. Yeah. Uh, whereas like, what it's actually about is the tool facilitates getting people in a room together. Right? And so part of what, even I mean, taking Twitter as an example, part of what's interesting to see there is when people actually organize online to end up somewhere together to do something, uh, which we still see a lot of, but I, I, I mean, how do you negotiate that with, how does, how does Twitter stay running, right? Like, they do have to figure something out to, to function. I, I mean, I guess people, they could ask for donations from people the same way. We could just go this. private, you know? It's really what they have to do, is get, get out from under their shareholders. They're more than, more than profitable. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of a, an easy one. It's funny, you know, I, I did this talk a long time ago where I quoted Timothy Leary, who had, he was doing these talks at Berkeley, and a girl had just had her first big psychedelic experience. And she got up and she said, Timothy, Dr. Leary, you know, I had the experience and I saw the light and I understand we're all connected. Now what? What do I do? And he said, find the others. <laughs> I gave a talk where I explained that, and then Scott Hefferman was at that talk, and that week he came up with the idea to do Meetup. And, and the idea of Meetup was, let's do something that's like Yahoo Groups, except the purpose of the net is to get people connecting in real places offline, you know, to, to facilitate the real world rather than replace it. Right? The only people who want the net to replace the real world are people who don't mean us any good. Right? These are people who want to just market us to death and, and, and monetize our social graph and make our behaviors more predictable. That's what big data is for. They use big data of our past to advertise the future to us that we haven't yet realized we're going to live. Right? And turn us from 80% probability of going down that lifestyle path to 90%. So they're trying to reduce anomalous, strange, unique human behavior in order to amp up their returns. Technology should be for the opposite purpose. Right? Technology should, be, should get us together and get out of the way. Because the, oh, we're only here for so much time. Let's say you got 100 years. What do you want to do with that? What do you want to do with that? Do you want to do that with Google Cardboard? Or do you want to do that with, it's 3D already. <laughs> industrial to local balance in what we do. You know, and what, what I would encourage is that we make more of our choices on a local scale and then start to see how that balances out. You know, it's, it's, there'll still be Walmarts, but I think there could be fewer of them. You know, it's really, it's, it's, it's about balance. I don't think it's a matter of, you don't crash the gates. This is not about a revolution where we go and take down the big companies. They're all going to go. There's some things that industrialism is really good for. Making power plants, making cars. Make, there's a lot of stuff that it's good at, but there's a lot of stuff that it's doing that it doesn't need to do, like industrial agriculture, 
which is ultimately less efficient. It's less resource efficient than permaculture or organic farming. It just is, but it's regulated into existence. So, I mean, have you looked at a map lately of, of the topsoil condition on, of America, much less the world? We've screwed it up. We've addicted our crop to industrial agriculture. So unwinding that slowly is something I'd like to see. You know, and, and it might mean, in some cases, eating food that happens to be available in that season. Whoa. But, <laughs> but then you start to find out that I'm not getting sick because I'm not eating stuff that my body isn't kind of ready to be eating and that's it. When you start doing, you know, you start reading all your uh, uh, naturopathy stuff and what they're telling you to eat in what season, you see, oh, and it happens to just grow right then. So it's, it's, it's not a matter of me saying, oh, we've got to stop all this and do all that. Um, but to say, let's start making some choices, that there's a whole lot of companies that could be structured in ways that promote more uh, either local activity or promote the velocity of money. So Walmart's biggest competitor now is Winco. Right? Winco's out west. Winco is a giant supermarket chain. They have these big box stores, and they're taking Walmart down. And the difference is Winco is owned by the employees. Winco is a co-op. So when you talk about efficiencies, Walmart's efficiency is we're going to pay these workers as little as possible, and we're going to let their health care be taken care of by welfare because they don't make enough money to even have insurance. That's their way of cutting corners. Winco's way of cutting corners is saying, we're not going to have shareholders that we have to pay money to. We don't have to take 90% of our profits and deliver it up to these people who don't give a hoot what we're even doing. They just want their money. So, it is possible. I mean, and as you do that, there's going to be less shareholding opportunities for people. Uh-oh, then what do we do? Then we're going to have to start investing locally. You're going to invest in the local pizzeria. You're going to invest in the local bookstore. And you're going to get in at the ground level because you know that guy. You're not buying shares retail 90 layers of investment after. You know, you're the, if you're buying a stock, you're at the bottom of the pyramid. That's by definition. If the stock's available to you, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> you know, but if, you're, if you can actually support a local business, you know, this is what I've been suggesting to banks, is that instead of just lending, if a pizzeria wants to expand and have a new couple of new bathrooms and another dining room, instead of just giving that pizzeria guy $100,000 and he's going to have to pay back with interest, what if you give him $50,000 contingent on his ability to raise the other $50,000 from the community. And you give them the nice little iPhone tools that they can raise. You get $100 from somebody, you get $100 from a patron, and they get $120 worth of pizza when the new restaurant opens. So now that person's gotten a 20% return on their money in the first year, which is more than they're going to get in their Smith Barney account. The pizzeria can pay it back in pizza, which is cheaper for them than money. And the bank is no longer seen as the pure extractor of value from a community, but as the facilitator of community reinvestment in that community. Then with that $100, I've got a bigger pizzeria on my main street, a more thriving main street. My property values go up, tax base goes up, my schools get better. I mean, whoa, what's happened here? It's really simple, right? So it's a matter of just rebalancing things, not shooing the banks out of the room, you know, but helping them participate as partners in a human economy rather than just as the uh, uh, extractors of value from human activity. Uh, thank you very much for all of this. And I um, am someone who didn't read the book, of course, so my speed reading skills aren't there. But, uh, I'm really I'm listening to you bring up these examples, and you know I'm I'm also reminded that for all the ones you say like well they, they can do this and they have done this or whatever I'm thinking also about the places you know that, that have problems. So REI is a member-owned co-op, and they've had some labor problems lately. Um, just being a member-owned co-op or just being local does not ensure that this all these evils are away. Um, that's the one point about it, that you know, this isn't necessarily a panacea for all things. And the other thing, too, is uh, Greenlight Bookstore, which I'm going to correct you, is actually in Fort Green and not Greenpoint. Um, but uh, it's also now uh, doing a second, they're doing the funding model for their second store, which is in Park Slope. Um, and I, I think about it, it's great that they're doing that, and I love the bookstore, um, and I thought about investing, but it also occurs to me that, okay, they're going to do it in Park Slope. Uh, what's the chance they're going to do it in bed -Stuy or East New York? You know, they're not. And that's the reality of it. And so while it is great that you know a local model that, that funds out of the community, 
for those communities without economic wealth and development, then the question becomes, okay, how do we ensure that they're able to participate in it? Which is something, say what you will about Walmart, at least it's bringing to those communities something. Um, and maybe it's taking more, but at least how do we then ensure, if you're saying regulation papers are big players, we want government or regulation out of that, how do we then ensure, put a mechanism in place that ensures some equity into this model? Well, I mean, there, this is not a, uh, this is not a phenomenon of the cultural creatives of Ithaca. You know, all the stories about local currency always talk about Ithaca or Berkeley or somewhere, but it's also happening in East Lansing, you know, and, and in the Steel Belt. You know, it, it, look at what Majora Carter did in the, in the South Bronx. You know, it's not, uh, in some ways, the, the people who are, are experiencing the greatest economic hardship have the least attachment to these bankrupt models and the most willingness to do things. You know, when I when I think about what's going to happen, I feel like either we're going to do this by choice, and those of us who have the choice to do it are in the best position to do it by choice, or we're going to do it by necessity, the way they did back in the Depression. That's when we saw local currencies come up. That's when we saw you know different kinds of of, of community script evolve and and all sorts of little comedy plots. Um, so no, as far as as far as green light. The, the popes who came up with the, the theory of distributism and subsidiarism in response to Marxism, the, the popes got asked, what are you guys, uh, 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 communist or, or capitalist? And they said, well, kind of both. We believe in the free market, people should have the ability to make money, but we also believe in this thing we call distributism. What, what they believed was that workers should have access to the means of production. Right? They should own the means of their own production. And as long as they can, then they're going to participate. And the other thing they argued for was something they called subsidiarism. And the, the, the principle of subsidiarism meant that a business, a business shouldn't be bigger than it needs to be in order to do what it does. So they would probably argue, look, you probably shouldn't open that second store in Park Slope. What you should probably do is find someone in Park Slope and teach them how you did what you did. Show them, what, and if they want to give you a little, you know, fealty, you know, give you a percent for bringing them the, the model, the technology, then fine. But don't expand, don't grow for the sake of doing it. Try, it's got to work for itself. And if Greenlight doesn't work at the scale that it's, that it's operating in its own, if it needs to expand in order to do what it does, then it needs to look at um, how it's operating again. It needs to look at how it's creating value in this community. Because the, the, if it has a growth imperative, if this company needs to grow in order to stay alive, then it either hasn't found the right size or it hasn't found the right model yet. Uh, two things. One, uh, how do you feel your ideas work in a world where the little guy trying to start a business is faced against almost insurmountable odds of trying to stand out against large competitors? Let's say a small news site, for instance, tries to come up. Well, they can't afford Google ad dollars to make themselves shown. They can tell good homegrown stories, but if they can't get their word out because no one can find them, how do they compete? How do you see this world like that? You talk about small businesses, but how do you open a small business in New York with rents? that only allow for the way to be in the next NYU extension. So, right. so how well, that in the, two, the two models you're using are the wrong locations to try to start a small business. Right, so if you're trying to smart, start a small publication, you cannot compete on the generic internet. It's not going to work. There's bigger players there with more bank. I mean, say what you like about, about net neutrality. It's already gone. Right? There is no net neutrality. The net is not neutral. It just isn't. You know, the, the, you know how the bandwidth costs. If you have a site that people are looking at, you've got to find more money. It, it doesn't work. They've already worked. worked well, it's, you know more about this than me. But they've already done the work around. You know, the idea if you have a publication, then you've got to target it to the humans that you can relate, that you can talk to. You can't be at everything. You can't compete with the New York Times. You can't be a news site. But if you are the pizza site, you know, then you can find your community. And the net's actually really good for finding the non-local community of people who want to be in your, uh, uh, who want to be part of your community. I don't, 
wouldn't call it an affinity group. That's what Facebook does. That's, you know, that's our communities. Those are affinities about, oh, we like minis, or we like, you know, four Tauruses. If you want to find, a, uh, uh, if you want to start a publication, it's got to be so targeted, so tagged, that you find those people and then build from there. Same thing, if you want to start a store, starting in Manhattan is really tricky. If you want to open a restaurant in Manhattan, you pretty much need VC. Because where are you competing? You're competing in Millionaire's Row. I don't live in Manhattan. I'm an author. I can't live in Manhattan. Not since the Bloomberg bubble was put around it. I mean, I can't uh, imagine how you do that. I mean, even this, Civic Hall. How do they do Civic Hall? Because they got Google and, and giant partners feeding into this. They're, they're able to operate at that scale. But no, you can, you can stake out real estate online, but it's going to have to be focused and specific and, and in a way where you know you're gonna have to address a need that is not you know that is not being met and then then people will come. Very good. A question about the, the the global conversation. Are there I mean like for example Wikipedia or sort of uh, decentralized opportunities where the global aspect of it allows for uh, certain virtues that I think fit with, with what you're talking about. I'm just wondering how, how we sort of differentiate um, between those two. Does that make sense? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> how we differentiate between um, some of the, the global opportunities that um, that allow us to first find the niche out there of all the you know weird people that we want for that small, but also uh, be able to have the you know the the encyclopedia that can beat out the Microsoft encyclopedia because we've got the whole world or um, you know or blockchain possibilities. I don't mean Bitcoin, but the possibility of you know global voting and things of that nature, and and also uh, a conversation about you know nation states are probably not going to be the solution to most of our major climate problems. We're going to have to have some kind of global coalition or initiative. I'm just wondering where you see the virtuous possibilities. Uh, I, I completely see where you're coming with the local and I completely agree, but I'm, I'm just wondering if where, where you leave the solution space for the oh, virtuous global I mean, I see, I see, uh, the global space is to me is more idea based than commerce based. Now, I think it's it's easier to disseminate an idea to a lot of different places, and then different people can work on that idea in lots of different ways. Sort of the way you know the open source caterpillar trucks and stuff. You know, and disseminate those to a lot of places and let people build things themselves. Um, I love disseminating plans to a lot of places. That's why I, I, I think back to the, the, the era when you could start a national movement by sending out handbooks, like the Boy Scout handbook. So you want a Kiwanis club or a girl, you know what I mean? You have a, oh, here's how you do it, and then you kind of do it your way. It's sort of, I mean, I'm perfect people of a book. That's what Torah was for. You got a Torah, you're going to set up a shul, you know? Uh, <laughs> and your community is going to decide what's kosher and what's not. Oh, you guys eat that? You know, um, which, which is sort of the way it's sort of the way it went, but it, it worked. You know, it worked in that in a in a decentralized fashion. So I, I think the, the the idea of global commerce is very different than the global idea space, and that's interesting. A very interesting switch because in the early internet, we thought of everything globally, and we wanted to get government off there because oh, they're going to make it all national and put up boundaries. What we didn't realize is that by getting government off. We created an open market for corporations to come in. It's sort of like if you get rid of all the bacteria, the fungus rises. You actually need some bacteria to fight the fungus together so then you can just live. Right? Let them battle it out. So we should have let them be there rather than just declare cyberspace. This is a government free zone. We don't need any of you. You know, it's like, oops, well, those are the other players we didn't recognize. And they took over the thing. So when now when we say global, of so many people back to the WTO protest think we mean global markets. You know, which is what Wired meant by global internet. Oh, the NASDAQ is going to go around the world and grow more and the biotech 
1987 is no more. Here we go. We have a new poster child for infinite expansion. They said we're going to be in the long boom. It's going to grow forever. That was just uh, a, a imperialism by another name. You know, is all that was. And uh, but it doesn't negate the fact that the internet is still a global network, and it still has the potential to disseminate ideas. Um, and, and, and entrepreneurial ideas, if you want to even call them that. Entrepreneurial ideas that can spread. A, a, a global time dollar would be really interesting. How do you network a whole bunch of global time dollars? You know, that's, that's almost a holy grail, so that I can make money here and it's still somehow good over there. I mean, it's interesting stuff. I mean, even when you're on eBay and you get something that's like, ooh, I just bought something from Turkey. That was kind of weird. What was that? You know, and it facilitated, I know eBay's evil in its way, whatever, but they facilitated commerce between people in a way rather than just extracting value from people. Okay, so I got the single temporal one more question. Uh, a woman. Yeah, I was actually <laughs> trying to see if there were any women who asked question. That was actually specifically what I was looking for. <laughs> Person of color. <laughs> uh, next week in New Rochelle, we have a meeting about developing a, a fiber optic network. I mean, what advice would you have about that for us for the meeting? And we apply if anyone's interested. Well, she would actually have better advice than I would. The, 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 the advice I would have is to look out for the lawsuit that Time Warner or Verizon or whoever your cable provider is going to pitch against you. You know what they did when people try to create municipal Wi-Fi or municipal broadband? The companies sue on the basis that locals have an unfair advantage because they're local. That's horse punky. Locals should have a home field advantage. This is, that's the one thing we humans have is a home field advantage on planet Earth. Corporations are alien. They are abstract. They are not real. Right? They are just computer programs. They're box. They're algorithms. Right? So defend your home field advantage and argue that in a court of law which is still adjudicated so far by human judges. You know, and they can stand a chance. You know, and this is really all we're doing. Then you stand a chance of fighting against the regulation that prevents people from engaging in commerce on equal or better footing than the corporations that have usurped it. I'm also happy to talk about it. <laughs> um, there are a lot of good examples to learn from uh, that a lot to do with how you manage your partnerships to um, allow to still be owned by the community. Because uh, I think the municipal ownership aspect is really important. So, yeah, uh, with that, I think we're going to close. It means everyone can just come and ask their questions individually. Yes, sure. um, or if you want to talk to me. So thank you. Excellent. So much. Thank you.